In the video today, we're answering a viewer question because Marlin B asks us, where did the GPGPG13 R and X rating system come from? All right, so let's get into it. Thomas Edison is often credited for building the first film production studio nearby his home and lab in West Orange, New Jersey in 1893. It was called Black Maria, or The Dog House, by Edison himself. That is where he shot the short film The Edison Kinetoscopic Record of a Sneeze, otherwise known as Fred Ott Sneeze, in January of 1894. This became the first film to be registered for a copyright. Two months later, Edison's employee William K. L. Dixon filmed Carmen Cita, a Spanish dancer. In some places, her projection was not allowed to be shown due to it revealing her legs and undergarments as she twirled. This was perhaps the earliest ever case of film censorship. In March of 1897, James Corbett and Bob Fitzsimmons boxed one another in Carson City, Nevada. It was watched live by thousands of fans, but it was soon going to be seen by many, many more. Enoch Rector had used over 11,000 feet of film to capture the spectacle, and two months later the film premiered in New York with a runtime of over 100 minutes. The Corbett Fitzsimmons fight is often credited as being the first feature film. It would eventually be shown in 10 different cities over an 11 month period. At the time, prize fighting was illegal in every state in the US besides Nevada, but it wasn't necessarily illegal to show prize fighting, hence the popularity of the film. In response to this new technology circumventing the rules, seven states, including New York, all passed a law fining those who showed the film. While in most cases it was shown anyway, this was one of the first instances of governing bodies attempting to regulate what people watched on film. Ten years later, Chicago became the first city to regulate and censor movies in general. With over 150 Nickelodeons across the city and the Chicago Tribune announcing that they had an influence that is wholly vicious, censorship rules were enacted in 1907. The city council gave the chief of police the power to issue or not issue permits for the exhibition of moving pictures. If a movie didn't meet his standards or someone he delegated the task to, a permit would be denied. The United States Supreme Court ultimately upheld Chicago's right to do this. Additionally, Chicago created a separate pink permit to mark those whose movies were adult only. This, however, backfired when the pink permits acted more as an advertisement than a deterrent. In 1909, New York City, by order of Mayor George B. McClellan, closed 550 theaters because the police chief claimed that most movie material was reprehensible. In response to this, the National Board of Censorship was formed as the first formal attempt by the film industry to ward off legal film censorship through quasi-self-regulation. For a small fee, the board would recommend cuts. Fast forwarding a few years later, and Mutual Film Corporation was a newsreel company that was getting annoyed by the fees and slow turnaround time on what they could show and what they couldn't. They insisted that film should be protected under the First Amendment, that's freedom of speech, and should not be subjected to censorship. The Supreme Court, they disagreed. In Mutual and Ohio Industrial Commission, Chief Justice Edward White wrote, the exhibition of moving pictures is a business pure and simple, originated and conducted for profit, like other spectacles, and not to be regarded as part of the press of the country or as organs of public opinion within the meaning of freedom of speech and publication. This all brings us to 1922, when the Motion Picture Producers and Distributors of America, the MPPDA, was formed. They hired former Postmaster General and head of the Republican National Committee, William Hayes. His job was, among other things, to lobby Washington on behalf of the movie industry. Pertinent to the topic at hand, he also helped form a list of commonly rejected themes, subjects, or occurrences that he asked movie studios to heed, called the Don't and Be Careful list. Some of the don'ts included the illegal traffic of drugs, white slavery, and ridicule of the clergy. The Be Careful, in the good taste may be emphasized list, included methods of smuggling, the use of the American flag, and men and women in bed together. In 1930, the MPPDA set up the Motion Picture Production Code, also known as the Hayes Code. It didn't wield any real power until it joined forces with the Legion of Decency, an organization created by the Catholic Church, as well as other religious organizations that was dedicated to combating objectionable material. From that point forward, the MPPDA would only approve films that had the Catholic Church's seal of approval. The Legion of Decency would also assign ratings to the approved films. For instance, the original 1940. Miracle on 34th Street was given the dreaded B rating by the Catholic Legion due to the mother in the film being divorced. If you're not familiar with a B rating announcement, that is that the Legion found it morally objectionable in part. 
Later, the B and C, condemned by the Legion of Decency, were merged to be one rating, O for morally offensive. However, a few notable cases threatened this status quo. The MPPDA, which would soon be renamed the MPAA, Motion Picture Association of America, would not approve Howard Hughes's film The Outlaw because it was deemed that there were too many shots that emphasized Jane Russell's bosom. Hughes was insistent that the film and Russell's chest needed to be seen, so in 1946, five years after the film was shot, he signed a distribution deal with a non-MPAA signatory. This was United Artists, a studio founded by actors Charlie Chaplin, Mary Pickford, and Douglas Fairbanks. This began to erode the MPAA's power. Further, the Hollywood Antitrust case of 1948 declared that it was illegal for studios to own the theaters as well, prying the door open even more for exhibitors to pick and choose what movies they wanted to show, no matter if they had the MPAA's approval or not. Next, in 1952, the Supreme Court reversed their 1915 decision by saying that expression by means of motion pictures is included within the free speech and free press guarantee of the First Amendment. That combined with a series of films, 1955's Man with a Gold an arm, 1956's Baby Doll, and the 1960 British film Blow Up that openly defied the MPAA's censorship ruling yet were exhibited and did quite well financially, set the stage for a complete overhaul of the MPAA's system of monitoring. Jack Valenti worked for President Lyndon B. Johnson in the White House as a special assistant to the press before he became the president of the MPAA in 1968. Thanks to his experiences and proximity to one of the greatest negotiators of the age, Valenti knew how to work with groups in order to reach a compromise. In 1968, he instituted a voluntary movie rating system because, as Valenti put it, the Hayes Code had the odious smell of censorship. From 1968 to 1970, the ratings were G, general audiences, M, for mature audiences, R, restricted, under 17, admitted if accompanied, and X, not admitted if under 17. In 1970, M was changed to PG, parental guidance, due to the confusing nature of the term mature audiences. As for the X rating, as you might have noticed there, it wasn't synonymous with pornography in the beginning. This didn't happen until the 1970s. The MPAA never trademarked the X rating, unlike the other ratings, and it was hijacked by the pornography industry as a means to hype up their material, often adding several X's to imply that their film was much more risque and obscene than others. In fact, several mainstream and well-regarded movies were given X ratings when they were first released, before it became strongly associated with pornography, including A Clockwork Orange and Midnight Cowboy. In 1990, this pornography association ultimately gave rise to the MPAA abandoning the X rating in favor of a new NC-17 rating for films where those under 17 were not to be admitted. Six years later, this was changed to anyone 17 and under, making 18 the new age requirement for these films. As for PG-13, it was Steven Spielberg who helped usher in that rating. When Jaws was released in 1977, it was rated PG, despite the violence being deemed too much for young kids, but of course deemed not enough that it needed an R rating. In 1984, he directed Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, and was the executive producer on Gremlins, both of which received a PG rating, which, granted, stood for parental guidance, but if a parent hadn't seen the movie first, it was difficult for them to tell much based on this rating. Thus, Spielberg and many others felt the PG rating was too broad, and and suggested a PG-14 rating. The next year, the MPAA, taking Spielberg's suggestion, instituted the PG-13 rating, with Red Dawn being the first film with that rating. And the rest, as they say, is history. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do give us a thumbs up below, and don't forget to subscribe for brand new videos just like this every day of the week. For more from me, why not check out my other channel, Biographics. I am linking to that below. And as always, thank you for watching.